Welcome to Laptop Radio. Today's topic is how decentralized finance is disrupting centralized finance with Clip Finance. We have Arthur Shabak with us. Hello, Arthur. How are you? Hey, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Where are you based? Right now, I'm in Estonia. I used to live on the East Coast in New York, in Miami. But I've been to Bay Area a lot of times. So it's a good awesome. place. Awesome. I love Estonia. I'm also an e-resident there. So it's pretty awesome. Wow. Tell us your story. Sure. Look, I started the computer doing IT professionally more than 10 years ago. I was in Estonia as a developer, Java developer, but I always wanted to make my own startup. So mm -hmm. I started doing websites for other people. Mm -hmm. and that was Estonia. E-commerce, WordPress, this kind of things, like simple websites. But I knew that this services business is not scalable. Therefore, the product is something that I always needed to do. And then I went into the fintech because the banks are lacking good integrations between each other. They are like really closed. That is actually what leads to this DeFi and to this love of DeFi, the de decentralized finance that I love. So I'll get to this. But anyway, about 10 years ago, I was making the API of the banks into one single API mm -hmm. where you can balance statements, transactions. That is now Yardly. Now is this other companies like Plaid or Blade, how you say this, yeah, right? Yeah, Plaid, right. But yeah, so I did something like that, but it was not, I didn't like this feedback loop from the banks that it took long. They didn't have this APIs available. They needed to tell it to their management and nobody made a decision anyway. And then I discovered Bitcoin, crypto Bitcoin 2013. And I knew I have to build something on top of this because every five, between five, 10 years, there is something, there's a new platform coming out in the world that you can build on top. Actually, right now, this five years is exactly what I mean. Before Bitcoin, there was mobile apps, right? Mm -hmm. The iPhone, Android apps, the new platform. I missed that train mm -hmm. because I was still too young. I was still studying. Then came Bitcoin. Then came Ethereum, which is some smart contracts, which we're going to talk about this. And now came the AI. AI was always there, but it's just this boom. So you see, yeah. yeah. And then uh, I went to New York, 2014, started the first successful crypto business, Paxful.com. It wasn't easy in the beginning, just like now in decentralized finance, that people don't get it. It's hard to use. It's risky. All these kinds of reasons, because people are used to log in with an email or right, the Gmail. But here you have to completely shift your head around that you are in control of your funds. So I had this exact challenges in 2014, 15 with people. But look, now at its peak was doing $40 million a week in volume. That mm -hmm. is Paxful is P2P marketplace to buy, sell Bitcoin. We have made it super simple user experience wise to buy Bitcoin with 300 different ways. PayPal. <laughs> Yeah, PayPal, banks, Western Union, debit credit cards, because you buy directly from others. If you want to cash out your Bitcoin, what, what I usually do in US, I cash it out with Zelle on, on Paxful. It's just instant because you can't do that directly at Zelle, but you can do that on Paxful. Yeah. So now it leads to DeFi. In 2020, I got fascinated that people are making 10, 20% on their Ethereum. I was holding Ethereum for many years and not making anything. It was just going up in price. But then I started to research where this money is coming from. And my friends who even built, were building Ethereum staking back then, they didn't know. So it took me many sleepless nights to figure out what's happening. Like the new token emissions, you get the fees because you're providing liquidity. I'm saying all this bunch of terms that I'm going to go into. Liquidity providing, the token emissions, boat escrow, all, all kinds of crazy tokenomics that actually making you money. And the most interesting thing is you don't have a risk in losing the way you can lose in trading when the price goes up or down, because I don't like trading myself. I don't trade coins. I did some funny video, which is a parody. I don't like trading because it's basically gambling, I would say, because you, you don't know the market. I don't know the correct people who, who make the decisions, all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, I do DeFi which is yeah, where you give your capital and then you're making fees. In short, it's transparent because it's blockchain. It's easy onboarding because you just connect your wallet. You don't yeah. even have to log in. That's how it started that I realized that there are no good user-friendly products for 
people in DeFi. And that's how we started Clip Finance. So I'll stop here. Awesome. Yeah, I love DeFi. I think DeFi is awesome. But first, let's talk a little bit about your company, Clip Finance. What is it? What does it do? Clip Finance is a secure on-chain management solution for assets. You have stable coins, you have Ethereum, you are a normal user, like new retail user, or you are a decentralized exchange, or you're a new blockchain, you can come to us. Mm -hmm. and we would give you alpha in short, because in DeFi, people are looking for alpha, mm -hmm. which means um, higher returns. Everybody has it to their own risk levels, but basically they're looking for alpha based on the risk level. So that's what we do. Right now you can make on the Clip Finance 8% plus 7%. We're giving bonus on top. So 15% yearly APY, annualized percentage yield. It's more than US treasury bills, which yeah. again, makes sense to put in. And the risks, obviously, let's talk about the risks is you have smart contract risk. If uh, the smart contract can get hacked and then other risks is we're related to what could happen on our side on your side that's already this your wallet security that you're not going to get fish the scam somehow you're not going to give away your seeds and then if you're a decentralized exchange there is one problem that people put in their capital let's say you can give your liquidity like you give your stable coins into the exchange the decentralized yeah. exchange let's say it's hundred thousand and then this is getting used as liquidity. If you know, like market makers on normal exchanges do, here anybody can be a market maker in decentralized exchange. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're making the trading fees. And here are these things that this liquidity can be more optimized. We call them smart pools. Example, $100 million worth of liquidity sitting on an exchange, but only 100,000 is getting traded daily. So you have a lot of unused liquidity, 99%. So we can allocate this liquidity to some other places, to some other strategies. We call this thing strategies. So this unused liquidity is allocated into other strategies and exchange makes more money and the people who provide liquidity make higher fees. So again, this is a, again, another alpha. And when the new blockchain is getting released, people are, we call this term aping. People are aping into the new protocols, new blockchains, ape like, monkey it's like oh yeah we don't literally think we don't care the smart contract risk it doesn't matter like we just ape in because you make money sometimes people lose too but that's what took me a lot of sleep that's nice to figure out anyway with this new blockchains you can get airdrops and that's why people are aping in into the new blockchain they just want to provide their liquidity for some time and then they wait for airdrops that are tokens of the blockchain of the protocol and you don't really know if they will give the airdrop, they will do the airdrop, the blockchain, the protocol, just in case you're moving your liquidity to this new blockchain because you're making fees. And then again, until the new blockchain comes. And that's the big difference and you move there. That's the big difference between traditional finance and decentralized finance, that in traditional finance, I would say the customers, their capital is more loyal because it's really hard to move around. Let's say you're trading on Coinbase, you say you have your capital there and you're not going to switch to Gemini and Kraken easily <laughs> because just not convenient. You have to tr transfer over chain, but mm -hmm. in DeFi, we call it mercenary capital that you can just with the click of a button, move around capital. That's another big thing you have to take into account that you, there are people with their capital moving around different applications, just going for higher alpha. Mm -hmm. You use a lot of terms in the DeFi space. And let me ask you to explain some of these terms so that our listeners could better understand it. Let's start with DeFi. What is DeFi? So it's decentralized finance, literally decentralized finance. Okay. It's because it's on blockchain. Somebody argues the finance on blockchain is not really decentralized, but it's just simple to understand. If you can connect to some finance application with your wallet, MetaMask or some other wallet, you're basically using decentralized finance. Okay. And what is a yield farmer? A yield farmer is that person or capital that is hunting for yield, basically for return. So like I was saying, if you put 100,000 in, we give 15% at this moment, but it's going up or down. Mm -hmm. It's varying. It's not fixed. In one year, you're going to have more than 100,000 and 15,000 because it's accruing, right? It's Compounding. Compounding means when, let's say, you get a reward 
every 24 hours, this reward gets added to your existing principal that is also getting the yield. Mm -hmm. And I know that Bore A became really popular. What is aping again? Aping means you just move your capital to another place. Simple as that. Let's ape in there. Doesn't matter. Like, are you doing enough due diligence research or you're not? You just say that, yeah, I aped into this app or yeah. now I aped into this app. And what is a DGEN? DGEN is the ones who are aping in. There are two words. Either it's a decentralized generation. Sounds really nice. Or degenerate, obviously. <laughs> so do whatever you want. Again, these are the ones who are doing this risky strategies, who are aping in into more risky protocols. I don't mean risky in terms of that they can be hacked, but where you have risk of losing money as well when the token price goes down or the funds get locked. So then you're degen. Awesome. And what is a pool? A pool is a part of the centralized exchange. Oh yeah, it's a pair. If on a traditional exchange, there's a pair, mm -hmm. for example, BTC slash USD, mm -hmm. then a pool on a decentralized exchange is a USDT slash ETH. Mm -hmm. And what is impermanent last? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So because of this pools, when you give an, your liquidity to the pool, where the pair is not one-to-one, -one. like one-to-one -one means in price, USDT slash USDC is a one-to-one -one pair. You don't have their impairment loss because the price of those two both assets is the same, $1. But when it's Ethereum and USDC, the price of them is not different. And when initially it's a 50-50% ratio in that pool of 50% worth of USDC, 50% worth of ETH. And then when one of the other side asset gets traded more, you will get impermanent loss. So it's not possible to explain it, but like okay. to understand yeah. it, but I'm trying, right? So basically you can get out less Ethereum or, or more Ethereum based if Ethereum's price will go up or down on the market. Yeah. And it depends on when you get your money out. Yeah. Just two more words. What does liquidity mean? Yeah, it means capital. It's your money. But this is from the perspective of a exchange, from a perspective of an app, right? Look, I call app, protocol, exchange. This is all the same things, actually, for me. So it's from the perspective of the protocol. They say, oh, we have this much liquidity or we have this much liquidity. It's like in a normal life, like how much liquidity do you have? It's like this much money. I can put this much money in. Yeah. Okay. And then one of the last one is custodial versus non-custodial. Custodian means a wallet that is in control of your funds that... They can basically take your funds, wallet creators, providers, but non-custodian is they don't have control of your funds. They cannot take it away because you control the private keys. You sign the transaction. When you send out, they broadcast it. They cannot send it out. They cannot sign for you because the private key, that's the way crypto works, by the way. Yeah. The private key is in your possession. It's on your phone, pretty much. And yeah, but with a custodian case, the private key is in their possession, whoever is the wallet provider. Okay, got it. So it's who has control of the keys to your funds, basically. Correct. Okay, so let's just get started. This is an interesting topic. I love DeFi. How has DeFi changed people's access to interest and banking? Okay, yeah. Look, generally, it's a tiny drop in the financial world to be honest and the professional funds and so on are really not using decentralized finance like i said what is decentralized finance some part of that is also using stable coins so the stable coin market is around 140 billion dollars where people pay each other they usually do cross-country commerce right they, yeah. they, they do national commerce with stable coins and only 20% of the stable coins are in DeFi protocols. like, And so that's basically for us, it's a potential market where mm -hmm. even if 50% of all the stable coins will be used in DeFi protocols, that's even better. So that's one of our missions. But again, it's still tiny drop. There are not many funds. There are funds coming with their so-called risky strategies where they want to allocate some of their funds to crypto. They're still for them as crypto it's like you're buying some coins some btc eth other altcoins and they hold it or they trade it but this DeFi is even smaller part where 
they don't understand that even less. Yeah. Because the, the truth is, let's say right now you can make eight to 10% on your stable coins in DeFi, but let's say if there's a hundred times more capital, then you're going to make a hundred times less fees actually, because mm -hmm. this capital is being unused. So we're getting there. We're, we are moving towards getting more and more adoption. It's gradual. I'm not saying there's going to be some boom in DeFi. Like there's a boom when people buy Bitcoin every few years that is now happening in DeFi. Not really. Yeah, or make change. I think in 2017, when people were creating or building companies with... ICO. Yeah, with ICOs and blockchain, they were able to raise tons of money, but they didn't know how to manage their money. And for me, I think decentralized finance came out of it because then there's a focus on managing the money and treasury. And with DeFi... You have access to your funds, but you can also earn yields on it, yes. which makes it really attractive because if you lend or borrow, you earn a certain percentage back as collateral. I know we oh. haven't spoken about collateration yet, but I think we will talk about it because that's really interesting. How is that different from centralized finance? Does centralized finance have collateral? And what is the advantage of collateralization in DeFi? Yeah, that's a, also a good one. But look, I'll go back one step. One point is about this adoption. People want in crypto 100x returns. And whenever there's this BTC pump now happening, people, again, they want their 100x. So they will start buying all kinds of random tokens. If I tell them, look, you can make 8% now in our protocol, stable fees. Uh, some people don't care. Like most people don't care. They still see crypto as this gamble when there's a possibility to make 100x. So mm -hmm. it's that. And the collateralization, that's another big area. Mm -hmm. I have friends in New York who are in real estate and they want to use DeFi protocols where they give collateral and then you get stable coins. What's my use case with the collateralization? That I'm long ETH, mm -hmm. which means I don't trade ETH, but I still keep its value when it's going up in price. Let's say I deposit into money market. So where you can give collateral and borrow, these things are called money markets, like Aave mm -hmm. and sure. Compound. Yeah. Anyway, the flow is I deposit $1,000 worth of ETH to money market. Mm -hmm. I make some small percentage on that. There's like really literally like 0.1%. Mm -hmm. And then I borrow 600 bucks worth of stable coins like USDC. I pay 4% on that yearly interest. And now I'm earning 8% in clip finance my net interest is four percent so on 600 bucks that i borrowed i'm making four percent a year net mm -hmm. which means 0.4 24 bucks on 600 right and because i deposit a thousand bucks in ethereum i keep my ethereum now i'm making in a year i have 1024 dollars which means 2.4 percent yield so this is free money because i believe in crypto i'm a 70 percent Bitcoin maxi, 29% Ethereum maxi, and 1%. <laughs> something else could come up, who knows? Even though some are trying these blockchains every bull market. That Ethereum and Bitcoin will go up in value a lot. Therefore, I don't want to sell it. Mm -hmm. And not selling Bitcoin. So, yeah, I'm not selling Bitcoin nor Ethereum. And I'm making money on top. So now imagine instead of 1000 bucks, you got $1 million. So Now it's already $24,000 you're making a year. Just free money. Yeah, it's passive. Yeah. So with Clip Finance, the user can pick different attributes, like the amount, the risk, and the asset. Not really at this moment. We have one pool. That's the difference, again, with us and others. Most of the others, they make you to decide. They give you 20 different strategies. I call them strategies, pools, where you can allocate your capital mm -hmm. based on what you want, and then you move there. We are actually automating that for you. Okay. that we have decided which ones are the best strategies for you and you put it there. And that's why this APY, the yield is constantly stable, like 8%. Mm -hmm. Because if on one strategy, the yield goes down from eight to two, you don't know that. In other cases, you will have to manually yourself move somewhere else, but we do that for you. We're doing active liquidity management. That's another term. There's all this subterms there is in DeFi, there's this sub things, a lot of this small areas that are getting attention, like 
LSDs. Funny <laughs> abbreviation, but it's liquid staking derivatives. Yeah. Or LST, liquid staking tokens. Mm -hmm. And then active liquidity management is means, yeah, you are making that your liquidity or capital more active. Like I told in the beginning, you can unuse liquidity, move around. So yeah, Clip Finance does active liquidity management, meaning you put in your capital, we are deciding on strategies for you and we constantly monitor them, do our risk scoring and the, everything is transparent. You will see the returns, you will see the strategies, you will see our risk scoring. Mm -hmm. And now we promise this 8% plus 7% our own bonus now on top. How is that different from centralized finance? Okay, so you probably heard about Celsius and BlockFi. They yeah. went down. They went they, under, yeah. Yeah, because they were not transparent. And you can say, look, in the regulations they didn't help, right? The, yeah. They were not transparent. They say they give you 3% from Bitcoin, where, how? They start <laughs> telling on radio shows, on podcasts. Yeah, we are helping the underbank, just some kind of round talk speech, uh, how they're helping their unbanked instead of actually explaining where that yield comes from. Yeah. But in decentralized finance, like I said, it's all transparent. You can all verify yourself. You may not understand these things, but there's some people who do understand. Yeah. So, and in reality with this centralized exchanges or this centralized services like BlockFi, Celsius, what happened is they just outsourced their yield service where they take 3% BTC, they offer 10% on stable coins to some other companies. And these yeah. other companies, they made risky bets. They put in Luna in the UST, the USD. There was a stable coin on Luna blockchain, yeah. some other places. And then it just went down as a snowball cascaded. So everything collapsed in 2021. I don't remember. November was FTX, but then it was before that. Yeah, It was in June. I just wanted to clarify that there could be exchanges like FTX and other services that are more Web2 companies, but they manage the asset with their parties or on their own on the back end. And those are not transparent because they would promise you a percentage. However, you don't really know what's going on on the back end, just like FTX, which is a centralized exchange versus a decentralized exchange where they're supposed to take care of all the internal controls and risk management, but they did not. And they actually use clients' funds. However, there are decentralized exchange where you can see everything just on chain and you can right. see how much money you have and all that kind of stuff. And then there's also decentralized finance where you just sign in with your wallet and you can see everything there on chain. I do understand there's one reason not to show where the funds are allocated because of this secrecy, because of the alpha. Like the big funds on Wall Street, they don't give specific strategies because they don't want to share this alpha. They do this uh, early report to you. Like this, this is what we did, but it's not as transparent still. So th there's one reason not to do this. That's one of the bigger difference between decentralized finance and also centralized finance. And I think sometimes people confuse the two and they hate crypto just because some of these companies messed up and they are not even using the blockchain, but just managing people's funds with it. Let's move forward. What do you see in terms of the future of decentralized finance? Like I said, it's going to grow gradually. There will, with the typical crypto bull runs every few years, there's going to be some tourists coming in for the quick returns, but some will stay. Mm -hmm. That's why more and more people will use it. But again, this is a shift in mindset. People who are used to with logging in with email and the Google login, they will not easily switch to DeFi. I have an example. So my friend, I told him like, make 20% two years ago in 2021, you could make 20% yield in crypto. Make 20%, you just have to connect your wallet and deposit, look my blog here. I wrote it in a blog post how to do this. And he was, you know, I'm fine with using BlockFi, Celsius, even though they give me 10%. But he says he has his peace of mind because he's logging in with his email that he will not be scammed, fished for his wallet passphrase, the seed plus BlockFi, Celsius. They were backed by investors, therefore it's even safer. And look what happened. Mm -hmm. Look, it's again, it's people's habits. It's like, again, like 10 years ago when I was building this crypto Bitcoin marketplace, 
is the habits of the people. I can tell you an example. There's some African villages where people stand literally three hours in the line to borrow $20 for fish to buy fishing equipment. Mm -hmm. Then they go full day fish. Mm -hmm. They catch some fish. Mm -hmm. They sell it. Mm -hmm. The same fish in the market. And then they pay back this interest like five bucks more. Like literally it's a 25% interest day on a day. Mm -hmm. And of course, they optimize this, the time wasting that they send some of their children to stand in line, these kind of things. But imagine you can do that online with DeFi, with this money okay. markets where you can easily borrow with a fair percentage where it's the whole world that is basically there, let's say, giving this liquidity capital and yeah, deciding on this interest rates instead of you being in a small village, being dependent on one bank. I think there's a onboarding process for a lot of people who wanted to get into DeFi. I always think that NFT is almost like a gate opener for most people or as an introduction, or at least artists, into the world of crypto and blockchain. And then once they become an NFT artist, they get a MetaMask account and they start to learn about DAOs and they start to learn about DeFi. And I think DeFi is, is really not that hard. All you have to do is just go to a certain website, sign in with your wallet, that's it. But then there's this hesitancy to manage your funds. How hard is that to actually have own private keys and then keep track of the funds? There seems to be some resistance toward that, I believe. Yeah, so look, here's this. This goes back to most people don't have time to research they have their own other problems life whatever work the work day job evening they have family they have to please their wife uh, they don't have time to, for DeFi to learn it this is another point is you have to set a goal because some people come to me hey tell me everything about DeFi. i want to make money or that's one type of question second type is which coin should i buy that will moon or that will go 100x this kind of advice, I don't give that advice. So look, I don't chill coins, right? And then I don't waste my time when people say, tell me everything. I tell them, first of all, if you want to learn DeFi, it has to come from a goal. Set some mm -hmm. specific goal that you want. Like I told my example, in 2020, my goal was to figure out where this 10, 20% is coming from. Mm -hmm. And because I'm sitting on this Ethereum, I could be making with my Ethereum 10% on top mm -hmm. by not selling Ethereum. And then the second suggestion is uh, now that you started to research yourself, if you have specific questions, then come to me. I'm happy to answer specific questions because I see you're putting in effort because now you're asking specific questions. A little bit shifted from the topic, but that's my main point is that goes back to why people don't really care, don't have time for the DeFi because they have other worries. And that's why Clip Finance is simplifying everything. Like mm -hmm. I was telling you, yeah, let's skip the part where you already got the wallet. You already have the stable coins, which mm -hmm. we're going to be solving as well. But let's say you already have wallet and stable coins. Where do you put your capital to work? Mm -hmm. To us. And we are showing you in a transparent way where it's being allocated to in real time. And what's your yield? Yeah. You have two products, right? That are coming out. What are they? So right now we have this automated income vault, mm -hmm. which is yeah liquidity management where we move the capital between different strategies to keep the yield constant, constantly high. Mm -hmm. We say so. Then you can build all these new products on top where for other exchanges, we are doing this smart pools, smart vaults mm -hmm. that this about this unused liquidity. If the exchange has this unused liquidity, then some of that liquidity we allocate to some other places. For example, like give a liquidity to a bridge to Stargate or give liquidity to a liquid staking token protocols. And yeah. there you make fees. And then another big part is uh, fixed interest products. So we will have a upfront fixed yield product yeah. as well, where you give 100,000 mm -hmm. and you get 5% right away. Okay. Your 100,000 gets locked, you get 5% right away. And how we can do this? Well, and simple, because now we're making 8%. So this we will be making 3% on top. Because now you're happy with your 5% right away. Instead, you could have made 8% over the year, but you're taking your 5%. And then we are 
taking your hundred thousand and making eight percent. So this three percent goes to token holders. Go to basically Cliff Finance DAO. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna go too deep into that. I'm just okay in a simple way. Yeah, and yeah, you can lock your capital for a fixed time to get higher APY as well. The yield will vary here depending on how much fees we're getting, and it goes back to this DeFi where. Every participant is making fees. In traditional financing, the bank is making most of the fees. You're making a little bit. But in the decentralized finance, the fees are divided between the liquidity providers. And that's why it's not fixed. Because you don't know how many fees will be there in total. That's why the yield is not fixed, is varying. Yeah. Awesome. What is a vault? Okay. Vault is basically composed of different strategies. So you asked me, what is a pool? A pool is a pair on a decentralized exchange like Ethereum slash USDC. Mm -hmm. A vault is a specific strategy that where this capital is allocated into different pools, for example, or different other protocols, money markets. In our case, we call it strategy router mm -hmm. where we allocate to different strategies. So yeah, this vault is being used in DeFi because you put this money in a vault and this vault does something specifically. It, yeah, it allocates your capital or does some delta neutral strategies. It can be active vault. It can be one-time deployed capital somewhere. Yeah, that's it. And is there anything that you wanted to share that I have not asked you? I think it's going to be huge and you shouldn't stay out, right? You should keep trying it. If you have time, just keep reading and it just gives you better financial education, right? Yeah. As people in the world are saying, oh, the financial education is not present in school. They're not teaching you how to do X, Y, and Z. They teach you something else. This is a good thing to learn. For example, I, I was not aware before that you can give your Ethereum as a collateral, borrow stable coins mm -hmm. and live on that. That's what Robert Kiyosaki is, do, is doing in his book. He's basically saying, give your real estate as a collateral, borrow money with the example, 5%, and then yeah. buy real estate that brings you 7% yield. So you have net interest of 2%. Basically, you borrow with 1% and you have to put it to use this capital that gives higher percent. That's it. Mm -hmm. So he, he did the same thing. For that, that's what I learned. And banks are happy to give these loans because they know that you're making on top. It's nice. They like to give to businesses that are constantly paying them back. So yeah, it's just an example. You're leveraging. And what is one piece of advice that you have for the community? Okay. This is basically the same thing. You have to set a goal. Look, you want to learn about crypto and DeFi, set a goal, what you want to do. If, if you want to research coins that will 100x, yeah, please do this, right? It's like, oh, I want to make my 100x. Like, okay, please do this. Or something else. Once you set a goal, you have something clearly defined goal, what you want to do. Just follow that. Ask friends around and read blogs. Read Twitter, yeah. Listen to this radio show. That's how you get success. To summarize, how is decentralized finance disrupting centralized finance? Yeah, the liquidity is owned by people. It's transparent. And the fees that are being made by the protocols are shared between liquidity providers. So the fees are not kept by the bank, but they are shared by liquidity providers. Therefore, there is incentive to move into decentralized finance over time and plus another important thing is the servers are also decentralized which means the banks are paying huge server fees in decentralized finance nobody's paying server fees again there's just this incentive that everything will move to on DeFi rails mm -hmm. awesome thank you author thank you bye bye bye